Welcome to The Beer Show, starring me, John. This show's basically about me trying to uh, introduce new types of beers to people that may not drink stuff other than maybe Miller Lite or Bud Light, or people that tell me, you know what, I just don't like beer, because there's thousands of different beers out there, and I'm sure there's bound to be one that almost everyone would like. So I thought I'd go through, in this show, a bunch of different ones, microbrews, macrobrews, craft beers, whatever you want to, you know, call any of them, and give a little insight into them, and talk about them just a little bit and see what people think. So for the first time, for the first one, I decided to do one of my all-time favorite beers, Guinness. Many of you know the name Guinness, and a lot of you think, oh, it's too heavy to drink, it's, I can't drink enough of it, it fills me up. And we'll get into that a little bit later when we start talking about some of the great beers. But I thought I'd give a little background on the company itself and who started it. The story of Guinness starts way back in 1725 when a man named Arthur Guinness was born to a mother, Elizabeth, and a father, Richard. They let, after he was born, they chose a godfather for him named Arthur Price. Arthur Price was a reverend and he was also the Archbishop of the Cashel area in Ireland. Arthur becomes kind of important later on in his life. Because in 1744, Arthur goes to work for his godfather. His mother had passed on, and I never really found anything that happened to his dad, so I'm not sure why, you know, what happened there. But, uh, so he went to work for his godfather, and after about eight years working for Reverend Price, Reverend Price passed away. Reverend Price left Arthur his inheritance of $147 in today's money. Now, you gotta remember, though, at the time, in 1752, $147 was kind of a big deal. It was kind of a lot of money. So, this is kind of where the story of Guinness, the Guinness Brewery, begins. Because what Arthur did was waited about three years, and then he opened up his own brewery in County Kildare, about 11 miles outside of Dublin. He didn't call it Guinness yet. It wasn't this Guinness yet that we all know and recognize. But it was laying the foundation for it because he was able to work on his craft and perfect his craft working there. In the meantime, as he was doing this, in Dublin, the Grand Canal at James Street was being constructed. This also becomes important later on in the story of Guinness. So, Arthur is in his brewery for about four years, and in 1759, he finds a place in Dublin that really catches his eye. It's an unused brewery at St. James Gate, which is right where the canal is. It has everything he wants has access to the newly built canal, which will make it easy for Arthur to bring ingredients in and get barrels of beer out to the public. So, Arthur promptly signs a 9,000 year lease. 9,000 years, I know, you would never in a million years see a 9,000 year lease, but back then apparently business was done differently and he signed a 9,000 year lease on the building. And it cost him $147 which I think was kind of funny because the amount of inheritance he got was the same amount and that number just came up again. So it was $147 from the start to lease and then $66 a year, including rights to the canal. Hell of a deal. So Arthur bought the brewery and it uh, covered four acres in Dublin and it included a mill, two malt houses, a 12 horse stable, and even had copper in the land on it and a few other odds and ends that would work you know, real well for them. So, now the Guinness we all know, which is in this can, or this bottle, or that bottle, are all stouts, which is why a lot of people think they're real heavy, because they're usually a darker beer and heavier. Oddly enough, the Guinness that Arthur brewed in St. James Gate Brewery were porters and ales. Arthur was in business for about 14 years or so at the St. James Brewery, when uh, the Guinness Brown, the Guinness brand, actually found its way onto a ship and it's on, on its way to England. This was the first time in Guinness history it was exported. And everything seemed to be going along pretty well for Arthur. He was brewing his log, his, his ales and his uh, porters, and he was happy. And then 1775 came. Now, one year before the United States of America declared independence, Arthur Guinness was fighting for his independence. It was on May 16th, the Dublin Corporation Committee sent the sheriff to shut down and fill the channel that supplied his brewery with water. And his, you know, where he brought his ingredients in and beer up. So Arthur, in true Irish fashion, didn't want this to happen, picked up a walk, picked up a pickaxe and defended his brewery. So there was a little standoff and uh, it took some time to resolve. Nine years went by and the water dispute was uh, was pretty much settled and he was granted the water rights. 
for 8,975 years. Apparently Arthur was one hell of a negotiator to be able to get that kind of time. So with the water rights struggle behind him, Arthur cranked up his production. In the 1790s, the brewery was expanded in the form of two warehouses. Also in the 1790s, 1794 to be precise, Guinness appeared for the first time in a magazine. It wasn't an ad for Guinness, but there was a picture of a guy drinking a, a Guinness porter in the mag a magazine called The Gentleman Magazine. So he was starting to get a little bit of popularity, and he was getting noticed a little bit. At the end of the 1790s and 1799, Arthur decided it was time to stop making the Dublin ale he was making and focused on his porter. The porter would eventually grow into these three, the stouts. And the porter was growing in popularity pretty quick, so that's why he focused on it. Guinness actually has, on their website you can see it, and if you go there you can see it, I'm sure, the actual brewing ledger from 1799 that shows the last barrel of ale leaving that brewery, which not many companies in history or in existence today have records that old, so if you ever get around to Dublin, I would go, I would go see that. In 1801, he started production on another porter, the West India Porter. The West India Porter would eventually evolve into the Guinness Foreign Extra Stout, which is this one. I want to make sure you get the right bottle. This one here, over many years. The evolution of Guinness and the expansion would continue to the present day as Guinness is brewed now in over 25 countries and sold in over 120 countries. And it all started with one man and $147. In America today, we have four different Guinness brews. Three stouts and one lager. The most common that you see in bars and everywhere else is the Guinness Draft, which is still a stout. Then you have the Guinness Extra Stout, the Guinness Foreign Extra Stout, and now, after introduced in 2010, I believe March, was the Guinness Black Lager. All four of these beers contain the basic same ingredients. They contain water, barley, hops, brewer's yeast, but what makes Guinness unique across the board and for their flavor and color is that they roast part of the barley that goes into the, into the brew. And also, despite what everyone tells you about drinking a Guinness it being like drinking a dinner or it fills them up, even this Guinness stout here, per pint, only has 198 calories. That's less than a pint of skim milk and it's less than some of the light beers on the market even. Now, the main difference between these two and this stout is they have a little bit more of an acidic taste to them. Mainly because those two are, are carbonated with carbon dioxide gas, where the draft here has a mix of carbon dioxide and nitrogen. So, like I said earlier, all the beers pretty much have the same content in it, but the Guinness draft has a mix of combination, a combination of carbon dioxide and nitrogen. This allows the beer to be under extreme pressure in these cans or in bottles without being over carbonated and giving you that extra like acidic bite to it. Nitrogen also forms smaller bubbles, so when the can is open and poured into a glass, it gives it a very smooth, creamy looking head and a nice, smooth color and flavor. I believe this one's the better one. I believe it's smoother and it's, I, I drink it a lot. It's the one I like the most. They also keep it tasting fresh and keep it fresh when you pour it to simulate being poured out of a tap. There's a widget in these cans and in the bottle form also, which is something that no beer companies I, I think did until Guinness did it. Uh, the draft is also supposed to be served colder than the regular stouts. Some pubs actually serve it at what's called extra cold, at 38.3 degrees Fahrenheit. But standard, you should, you should serve it around 42.8. You know, the rumor is that in Europe and England, people drink their beer warm. They don't. Because even at 42.8 degrees, eh, it's pretty cold. So the draft, again, is pretty low in calories like the stout and carbs, but it has a heavy rep, so people think it's very filling. The draft beer has 125, 125 calories per liter, 9.9 .9 grams of carbs, and 3, 0.3 grams of protein. I'm sorry, it was per 12 ounces. Which, 125 calories in 12 ounces really isn't bad. It's less than a can of Coke, a can of Mountain Dew. It's less than most beers on the market, even. Because of that, it also seems to be the most popular of the four in America. Now, another thing with Guinness is they have a very specific way of pouring their beer. They have a very specific, more specifically the draft. They call it the double pour. The total pour on a double pour takes about two minutes. It's like 119 seconds, but whatever. 
And they say it should be served in a tulip shaped glass. And some of you may have seen the Guinness pint glasses when you've gone out before. And on the way to the tap, the beer passes through a chiller and is forced through a five hole disc shaped restrictor plate. This restrictor plate increases the pressure and the friction created by the beer going through it, which creates the small bubbles that form the head. After it's about half full, the glass is allowed to sit and it's allowed to rest until the head settles. Then it is poured the rest of the way until a slight dome is formed right over the glass. And what's really neat is if you have a good bartender or a good bartender at a pub, wherever, when they have the slight dome on top, some of them can use some of the leftover foam that's dripping out of the tap and put a clover on top or other, other designs. So it's really neat to me. Now, the foreign extra stout and the extra stout are basically really, really kind of the same. The difference comes into the fact that with the foreign extra stout, they take what's called the wart of the beer after they brew it, which is kind of like an extract, and they ship it to wherever this one's going to be brewed, and then that is that that wart is added to local ingredients from a destination, so it gives there's different alcohol content per you know different locations. The flavor is a little different, but it's basically this beer only localized. The U.S. version of this actually is 7.5% alcohol by volume, which is pretty hefty for a beer, where this one's only about 4.5 or 5. So that's, that's primarily the difference between these two. And they're both carbonated with, um, usually when you get them, it's both carbon dioxide. They're very, very similar. Now, the Guinness Black Lager is a new beer. Like I said, it was introduced in 2010. And it was introduced in basically to um, get new drink, new beer drinkers to get it. Because there are people that don't like stout beers and there are people that like lagers. So, it's the same basic ingredients, roasted barley, but the main difference is it's brewed as a lager, which means that the yeast is bottom fermenting, where a stout is top fermenting. So the flavor is different and the body is different of it. Like I said, the target audience is uh, different than most. It's primarily young male drinkers who they're targeting. They like beer a little colder than stouts, and they like them served, you know, maybe in the lower 40s, where a normal stout, like I said before, was low to mid 40s. So that's that's the new black lager. It's limited. It's only in certain markets. I, I'd say give it a shot. So those are the four basic Guinness brews available in America. Most of them are available other places also, but. Uh, some of the times the names are different. The extra foreign style has a different name. The draft is usually called the draft still though. And most pl some places don't even have the black lager. Guinness as a company has been around for 252 years now. Guinness does not seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. They're one of the most exported beers in the world. They're one of the most drank beers in the world. And they're one of the largest beer manufacturers in the world still to this day. And they have a huge following in many, many places. There's a lot more history to the company Guinness and behind this beer than I mentioned here, mainly because I don't, I'm not doing an hour-long show. I'm just doing, you know, a little 10-minute, 15-minute blurb. But I hope I was did enough to get you interested in finding out more about it and maybe giving some of the different flavors a shot, seeing if you like it. You know, I don't know if they're going to make their 9,000, make it to the end of the 9,000-year lease. I really don't. Be kind of neat if they did. But uh, they had a good start, and hopefully next time you're at the bar or your local pub, you'll give a nice glass of Guinness a shot. Thank you, and I hope you join us again.